guys, we're going to get started. So um, we're very lucky to have Sundar Kulkarni here, um, who is your SOM 99, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and he is the CEO of Showcase, home of the hottest trends, uh, which is a national retailer in Canada with now over 100 stores. 100 stores. Mm. And so he's going to talk about their attempted um, uh, bid to acquire Brookstone, among other things. So, put your hands together. Very good. Wow. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much. Is this uh, volume okay? Okay, that's great. So, any Canadians in the audience? <laughs> you again. <laughs> You're the one token Canadian here? Oh, one more Canadian? All right. Nice to see you. Okay. Uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm uh, born and raised in Toronto and uh, uh, came to Yale in 1997 and uh, graduated in 99. And it re really was a special time in my life and a special time for me. So I've always uh, been very close to the school and tried to, tried to give back in different ways. So it's really an honor to be here. I really appreciate your, uh, you attending uh, and uh, joining us. So I'll talk a little bit about Showcase and about Brookstone. Let me just put it in context and just talk about who Showcase is right now. Just a couple of slides, then we'll talk about the story. Uh, so basically, we're, this is what a store looks like. We're the world's largest retailer of our kind. Um, we're a, a shopping center retailer with uh, uh, relatively small size stores in uh, A and B shopping malls in Canada. Um, we basically focus on top trends, and we get them first fast, and we sell them exclusively. Often, so no, no hair remover. Have you seen? Have you seen this product? Heard about this product? It's a no, no. It's a hair treatment. Uh, green coffee, a weight loss product. When is the uh, non-lathering shampoo? A Nutribullet is a food emulsifier from the uh, makers of Magic Bullet. Zumba, the Latin dance fitness craze. Uh, Insanity, which is a workout video, and even wacky products like the Sticky uh, from the notorious man Vince, who came up with the Sham Wow before that. Do you guys know any of these products? Is this uh, at all familiar? Okay. So these are the types of products we sell. Often they are uh, uh, driven by television infomercials, but often they're not. Uh, but essentially they're products that are in the popular culture. Uh, they're products people want to know more about. Uh, and they're typically not widely available. And really the focus is, for us, is to be right at the start of that trend. As soon as a trend is emerging, to capture it and to bring it to life, commercialize that trend uh, quickly so that we can uh, uh, maximize the sales of that trend until it hits saturation. So at saturation point, you'll see it at every you know, corner store and at every Walmart, and that's our cue to get out and move on to the next trend. Okay? So that's really where we are in the product life cycle. Um, we're essentially Canada's trend retailers. So in, uh, oh, this is helpful. Uh, so in the US, you've got Brookstone, you've got the Sharper Image, may they rest in peace, they closed a few years ago, Discovery Store, Hammocker Schlemmer, all selling these sort of unique, uh, trendy sort of g gadgets and gifts. In Canada, you have Showcase. We are the place to go. Uh, we have 101 stores across the country. It's a fun and interact uh, interactive experience where you can come in and actually, you know, uh, get a demonstration, try the product for yourself, ask questions. Um, and our focus is on health, beauty, home, and toys. Any questions on sort of who we are? That was just sort of the the lay of the land. So let's talk about Toronto. So we have a couple of Canadians in the audience. The, uh, uh, has everyone been to Canada? Who's been to Canada here? Okay, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. All right. That's great. Uh, one of my, um, the moments I remember the most was when I came to SOM, they had a mandatory session for all international students. Uh, and it was called, it was sort of the welcome to America <laughs> session. Okay. And uh, so we were brought into a room, all the international students, and we were told everything from, uh, proper etiquette in saying hello to, uh, uh, to hygiene, to uh, everything and everything in between. So it was funny because I live 40 miles north of Buffalo, right? So, but I was uh, part of this international student group, but it was uh, a great time. Anyway, so um, uh, born and raised in Toronto uh, uh, as part of a business family. Uh, so that's me there. Um, uh, my father was an engineer at Nortel in the 70s. Uh, decided to become an entrepreneur. He quit and bought a, a small plastics business. Uh, if you remember The Graduate, I don't know if that's an old reference, but when he takes Dustin Hoffman aside and says, you know, the future is plastics, right? So my dad got into plastics and then uh, uh, the whole family really uh, got into business. He, uh, he, uh, so he was my, my business mentor number one uh, and business mentor number two was my uncle. Uh, and um, uh, we've been growing the portfolio of businesses uh, since the 70s. And so a business has really been in my blood. Fun fact here, that's my sister who is now our general counsel. 
So she actually uh, runs all uh, litigation matters for our, uh, for our group. So uh, it's, a, it's a sort of a family story. Um, uh, so I did my undergrad uh, in uh, Toronto, and at the same time, uh, we had a business that made video cassettes. It actually, we put the video cassette tape inside video cassettes. So at this time, this was a cutting edge technology, but um, it was the only business where uh, there was no family members in it except me. So that was the place I wanted to go. It was where I was gonna spread my wings, and so I uh, worked on that business for a few years during undergrad, uh, built it up and, uh, and, and made a little bit of money doing it. Um, and then I came to Yale. This is actually, uh, I wanted to put a picture of the building at that time, but then I, instead I thought I'd put this picture. Uh, but um, so I came to Yale and the first thing I realized is that you need to be at least uh, 21 or older to be served. So I was 20 years old at the time. Um, I think I was the youngest in the class. And uh, I turned 21 sometime uh, right at the start of the, uh, of the school year. So that's the first thing I realized. Um, but uh, one uh, quick story is about the Leadership and Organizational Effectiveness Club. And uh, this was a club that was designed to promote you know, strategic communication, organizational skills, people things, and all that. Anyway, we, we ended up transforming that uh, club uh, while I was there. It was one of my favorite things to do. And we did it through a very important strategic maneuver. A very important strategic maneuver using all of the education that we had gotten at Yale. And that was to rename it to the A1 Leadership and Organizational Effectiveness Club. Does anyone know why that's important? Yeah, go ahead. Showed up first on the list, right? So when incoming students saw all the clubs that they could participate in, we now were higher up on the list than consulting and finance and marketing that were taking all of our members. Uh, we also sent some shrewdly worded emails about being the coolest uh, club on campus, and so A1 became a, 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 a little uh, mini phenomenon. Um, I interned with the Yale University Investments Office. David Swenson, brilliant man, running the Yale uh, Endowment. Um, so got to know him and got to know Ellen Schumann. And they uh, po uh, posted me with one of the private equity firms in Dallas that was investing some of Yale's money. So I really got a taste for private equity uh, and uh, uh, being in the business of buying and growing and selling businesses. Um, and then at uh, 22, I graduated. Okay, so that was uh, the start. And the question was, what next? So all these goldfish over there are going in the other direction. Those are the investment bankers and the management consultants and everyone going to New York and San Francisco and uh, you know, getting on the corporate career track. And uh, they've done really, really well. Uh, but it really wasn't for me. I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I, I don't like to work for other people. I like to build my own uh, little thing. And so um, uh, they actually get you to fill out the form, right, about where you're going after graduation. And so I wrote there just as a joke, Empire Builder, okay, as my job title. And uh, every year they send me the, uh, the, the form again, right, saying, is this information correct? Please correct it if it's not. And for 15 years I've never changed it. So it still says Empire Builder if you look it up. But it was sort of my way of saying that I wanted to try to build something that was my own. Even if it was not as big as uh, other businesses out there, at least I'd feel like it was, it was personal to me. Um, and it was something that we could do to, to build our family's uh, uh, you know, wealth and so on. So, that's, uh, so the question was what to do next. And so I wanted to get into a business. And uh, the business that was up for sale at that time, it's not much to look at, was a small retailer called Showcase. Um, basically it had uh, 12 stores uh, in the major shopping centers in Canada. And the idea was, um, so 12 stores in 1999, the idea was that it sold as seen on TV products, typically products from infomercials, where people are curious, they're not sure about it, whatever. They want to know more about it. Um, so there was high curiosity about the product, but limited availability. Okay. So everyone wants to know more, and there are not a lot of places to get it, to get information about it, or to get the product itself. Uh, typically, the only way you could buy one of those products at that time was to call the 1-800 number on the screen and run over and get your wallet and order it and then wait eight weeks for delivery. Right? So that's changed in a lot of ways, but uh, that was the, uh, the strong reason there was to have a store like Showcase. And then we offered an experience where you could actually try it before you buy it, where you could actually get a no-no hair removal treatment on your arm, you know, that sort of thing. So it was a unique experience compared to most retailers where the product is in the box, it's behind the cash, it's behind glass, it's under lock and key. And so what I realized is that this is a smart idea. The founder of the business, brilliant guy, had founded it in 1994, very shrewd entrepreneur. 
Uh, it was a very smart idea, but it, it needed to be refined. It was being run in a, um, in, a, in a way a lot of small businesses are run, and it could have been refined and could be refined into something that could work on a larger scale. So that's how we got into it. Um, let me ask you a question. I'll test your memory for those of you who might know this. What was the number one product in our industry in 1999? <laughs> Just, I thought I'd try. It was Tybo Billy Blanks, if you remember, okay? It, we, you could not get enough of this, okay? Tybo was, was, was everything to us at that time. Okay, so that was 1999. Uh, and so in 2000, we started opening more stores and we, we moved up to 18 stores. And the idea was to put the building blocks in place to make a scalable model, right? We were running it in a, in a more haphazard way, in a very small entrepreneurial way. Could we make something where we could open lots of stores and have some consistency, some sta standardization, some systemization? Uh, and that's what we started working on. And so we moved the office to Toronto. It was based in Edmonton, Alberta, Western Canada. We moved the office to Toronto where I live. We uh, continued to franchise. Uh, I didn't mention this earlier, but this is a franchise business. So basically the store is owned by the franchisee who pays us to have a store. They own the, the, the store itself, they own the inventory, and their job is to make a profit selling the goods that we supply them, and we would support them with marketing and other things and, and take a fee off of, uh, off of their sales. So it was a franchise model at that time. There's a problem with franchising, which we'll talk about soon. Um, so we worked on putting systems in place, uh, having standardized procedures and point of sale systems and uh, internal audit and various things that a, uh, that a retailer needs. Uh, and Barry Nailbuff was a, a great mentor to me in the early days. He was, in a, he was on our advisory board. And uh, I, uh, I remember him fondly and we stay in touch. Uh, so that was 2000. Uh, number one product in our industry in the year 2000. Anyone? There's a list of things I gotta get done later today. Um, what did you say, ShamWow? Not, not yet, ShamWow came later. Number one in our industry was the Showtime Rotisserie by Ron Popeil, okay. Ron is a brilliant inventor. He came up with the pocket fisherman and the Showtime Rotisserie, the pasta maker. He even had the spray on hair uh, where you would spray. He actually gave me a demonstration of this. We were looking to buy Ronco uh, soon, soon after this and he's a really interesting guy. And so I'm standing in his, uh, in his uh, Beverly Hills home and he says, you know this, this hairspray in a can, uh, do you think it really, you know, do you think it works? I said, absolutely, Ron. I think, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's a great product. He said, well, you won't believe it until you see it. And so he, he said, come with me. He took me outside and we stood outside in the sunlight and he sprayed his hair. And he had, he had a very large ball spot. He sprayed his hair and combed it over and it was like he had a full head of hair. It was unbelievable, unbelievable product. Anyway, wacky guy. He said that Asia was his favorite market for the hair removal product. Any guesses why? Because he only had to stock one color, black. That was the only one, okay? So in America, he had too many SKUs, red, and blonde, and all that. He said, Asia's the best market for me uh, because of uh, one color. Okay, so then in 2001, we had gotten to 35 stores, and we were on a roll. It was a banner year. Uh, we had the, 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 the best year you know, we had ever had. The sky was the limit. We had tripled in size, you know, from 12 to 35 stores, and, and I thought, you know, this is, this is it. You know, this is, I've made it. Okay, so this was fantastic. Number one year in the industry that year was the Abtronic, okay? If you remember, this is the, the belt that you put on your uh, stomach and it sends safe electrical impulses through your muscles and uh, gives you the, the tight and toned abs that you've always dreamed of. So the Abtronic um, was awesome because everyone wanted to know, does it work and will it work for me? And so we did demonstrations of the Abtronic in, uh, in our stores and of course, once people felt the contraction of those muscles, they said, I gotta have this, this is amazing. Um, unfortunately, um, the storm was brewing because that fad lasted and then crashed. Uh, the Abtronic uh, died the year after. It had nothing to do with us. It was the advertiser, the, the brand owner, who uh, you know, basically overextended, uh, got into trouble about the claims that he was making on television, and so the product uh, tanked. Uh, and so by this point, we had grown to 46 stores and we were banking everything on this you know, trajectory that we were on. Um, obviously, we were too reliant on one item. The Abtronic in that year was 30% of our sales, one item. Right? So we were too reliant on one item. That's, that's an obvious problem. But it also made me soul search about uh, what I had done incorrectly or what I could learn from this, this fall from grace. Um, 
and the first was that there was too much theory. I had learned a lot of theory at SOM, and I was really excited to use it, really excited. And uh, what I found is that, in hindsight, is that there are all kinds of theories out there. There's theories going one way, and there's opposite theories saying the exact opposite. And the wisdom is in knowing which theory to use, as opposed to just applying theory. So I felt that uh, uh, it was uh, too theoretical. But one example of that is uh, the employee empowerment theory. So at that time, employee empowerment was all the rage. It was how do you give ownership and give authority to people throughout the organization rather than a command and control, centrally controlled sort of operation. And so we gave a lot of autonomy, especially to the franchisees who were business owners. And we said to them, well, why don't you set your own pricing? Why don't you carry the products that you want, that you believe in? Why don't you have a return policy that suits you, that you believe in? And so it created the situation where there was too much empowerment, too much autonomy, and it was not uh, part of a cohesive plan. So there's one example of too much theory. Um, we used to hire based on brand name. We would look at resumes and we'd say, oh, that's a company name I recognize, must be a great guy, must be a great gal. Um, we've learned uh, the hard way that hiring based on brand name is not effective. It's not the best indicator of whether someone will be effective. In fact, often uh, in, in our business, being a smaller business, Often people from large companies don't know how to operate in a small business. It's completely different. There's the, the, we don't have the resources, we don't have the checks and balances, we don't have the backup plans, and so someone from a smaller company may be much, much more effective for us. There's an example. Um, too much empowerment I talked about. And we were loose with money. Uh, we were spending like, well, we increased sales 50% last year, let's do it again this year, and let's spend tomorrow's money today. And we did that by hiring brand name people, we did that by uh, investing, over-investing in marketing, over-investing in branding, saying that if we build the brand, then people will pay us for that, reward us for that later. Okay. So we went too far, okay, and it really, uh, I look back in hindsight and say, uh, I learned a lot and I learned more from that than, um, um, than anything else. So in 2003, if you notice, the number of stores dropped from 46 to 29, and the reason is that we had a rift with the franchisees. The franchisees, their sales were dropping because uh, our sales were dropping. Uh, there weren't any hot products on television at that time. And so um, they started running out of money. And I stepped in and I lent them money. Cardinal sin. You heard it here third or whatever. Cardinal sin about franchising, right? If the franchisee is taking the risk and is going to reap the reward, then the franchisor should not be the one bailing them out. And, or, or seeing them through the tough times, because the franchisor is not gonna make up that money in the good times. Uh, and so there was a franchise rift around this and about the repayment of that money, and it led to a litigation that lasted for many years, but it was absolutely the best education I got. Uh, it taught me about the justice system. I know more about the law than I'd like to know, uh, but I understand more about how the law works. I understand how justice is a principle, and then, and then there's the law and the execution of the law, which may be two different things, you want them to match, and often they do, but they don't always. Uh, so for example, the spirit of the deal becomes irrelevant in a court of law. The spirit of the deal is not important. The letter of the deal is important. So here's something that, maybe it's obvious now when, when I say it, but uh, it's something that wasn't obvious to me at that time. The handshake, the conversation we had in the bar that night when we had that beer about how we were gonna lend money and how we were gonna get repaid, that became irrelevant in a court of law. So, uh, good education there. Uh, we ended up buying back all the franchisees as part of the settlement of that litigation. And the few franchisees that didn't want to get uh, bought back, they were spun off and became independents. They changed their name from Showcase and uh, most of them eventually cl uh, closed within a few months. And so we had uh, 29 stores. Uh, we had become all corporate. These were now our own employees, our own inventory. We were living and dying based on the sales in that store. Uh, and uh, that's where we were. So. That's when I said, never again, okay? This is a young Magneto um, saying never again, never again. Uh, I tell you it was the best lesson I got uh, because uh, my ego was really bruised and that's a great motivator when you want to, you want to win again. Um, it made me a lot uh, tougher, for sure. Um, uh, tougher on myself, tougher on people, tougher on being clear about how exactly this was going to work, how exactly this would make money. Um, how exactly it would be successful. Uh, we learned who our real friends are. Uh, friends aren't the, the ones who help you when times are good, but the ones who help you when times are bad, and so we learned a lot about uh, who our friends are and who our allies were. 
Uh, we also learned to manage risk uh, much better. Uh, up until that point, risk was an intangible. It was this thing that sort of um, exists in the background, but there's no real way to quantify it. Well, guess what? There, of course there's a way to quantify it. There's a, there's a way to understand the risk. Uh, so for example, when we look at our balance sheet today, we look at a risk-adjusted balance sheet, which is, because our biggest risk in our business is inventory and trends that rise and fall. And so we look at a risk-adjusted ba risk, uh, balance sheet when we look at our financials. So there's a way to manage and quantify risk. And we became ruthless about ROI. So it didn't matter what someone's opinion was uh, in the sense that they would say, trust me, this will work. Uh, it didn't matter uh, about the, the grand plans. What mattered was what's the return on investment, right? What is it going to pay for itself? When is it going to pay for itself? And so we stopped doing anything that wasn't going to pay immediately. And so for many years, we didn't do any brand advertising at all because there was no clear payback between brand advertising and sales. So we did only product advertising. People want to buy the Ronco Showtime Rotisserie, great, we'll advertise that product and uh, bring, the, uh, bring the customers in. So we became very ruthless about that. And so in that sense, failure taught me, uh, it actually gave me confidence to speak my mind. Uh, we also discovered that uh, we had many hidden assets in the business. By the way, this slide, see that American currency? That's for you guys, okay, that's for you. Uh, hidden assets. So the first great asset we had was a great team. We really had really smart people who had been through a lot. They're really, they're really, they're really good. And uh, we needed to figure out our direction. We needed to figure out our strategy. But we really did have a great team we could leverage. Uh, the second asset that uh, I uncovered is YPO. Have you heard of YPO? Young Presidents Organization. So I joined that organization around this time. Um, it is uh, an organization of uh, peers who run businesses. Um, and it becomes the confidential peer mentor group um, with no agenda. That's important, right? A mentor group where they have nothing to gain or lose by what business decisions I make. And so they became the best uh, advisors uh, on where to go with the business because they had, they had been through the same thing before um, in some capacity. Uh, and they gave really unfettered, uh, clean, clear advice. So I recommend for any entrepreneur have an advisory group have a mentor uh, group that you can go to and, and lean on that are not investors in your business, that are not in some way vested in which direction it goes other than in your personal success. Uh, and the other thing uh, was that I read Howard Schultz's book, Pour Your Heart Into It. I don't know if you've read it, it's a, it's a classic. It's about the growth of Starbucks. And in it, he devotes a whole chapter to the problems of franchising. And he says, if you have partners who have their own agenda and their own interests that may be different than the brand's interest or than the overall company interest, and, the, and you have this di misalignment of incentives all the time, then you really can't build a global brand. Now, it's not true, so certain global brands rely on franchising, but when I read this book, I said maybe all our problems were a blessing in disguise. Maybe uh, going all corporate, having control, having our people be our own people and supporting them with training and incentives and so on, and then reaping the rewards of that because we own the stores. Maybe that is the future. And so that gave me hope about where we could, uh, where we could go. And so in 2004, with 29 stores, we said, we need more eggs and we need them in more baskets. We can't rely on a one-hit uh, uh, wonder. Uh, and so we need to go about uh, expanding the, uh, the breadth and the diversification of what we do. Number one product that year, Viscoelastic memory foam, also known as Tempur-Pedic, uh, just amazing. So we would have uh, uh, beds, pillows, slippers in stores, and people would just put their hand on this memory foam, and it was the most amazing feeling, and the product was sold. They loved it. It, was, it really revolutionized bedding, uh, the bedding category. And so there's an example of a, uh, of a non-television trend. This was not driven by infomercials. Uh, so that's where we were in 2004. So in 2005, we had gotten to 32 stores, uh, and that's when we started looking to our counterparts. So our counterparts in the U.S. were Brookstone and Sharper Image, uh, and they were similar retailers but different. They were definitely much more upscale, higher price points, more electronics focused than we were, but in, in a sense, they were selling the same sort of things. They were selling new, unique, novel, gadgety, trending products in a small format specialty retail environment in malls. That's basically what they are. Brookstone had the airport component as well. Uh, and so we looked to them and we said, okay, well, what can we do to emulate them? It seems to be working for them. They're doing great. 
what can we learn from them? And so, you know, they had Tempur-Pedic, we had our own brand of memory foam. They had remote control helicopters, we brought in remote control helicopters. They had robotic massage chairs, we brought in robotic massage chairs. And we copied them in many ways uh, to carry similar assortment, but in a Canadian context, typically lower price points than, than in the US. And so we uh, went about diversifying our product lines. Uh, we actually ended up uh, negotiating a deal with Sharper Image to become their distributor in Canada. And so we had a Sharper Image corner in every showcase store. The problem was that it was all by trial and error. We were basically taking products that other people were selling and saying, let's hope they sell too. It was no indication of whether the products were successful or not. They just seemed to be there. And so we said, well, why not? Let's try it as well. Okay. And it was a painful trial and error process because it's, it's tough. It's tough to have a new and novel product and uh, you know, hope that it sells. Right? The customer is hit with so many different marketing messages and other things. It's, uh, it's not easy to pick a winner. And we found that out the hard way. Uh, so that's uh, 2005, number one product in 2005. The magic bullet, the magic bullet. You can get anything you want in 10 seconds or less with the magic bullet. Um, so that was uh, uh, the big hit of that year. So in 2007, uh, we were at 35 stores and it became a more uh, systematized and mathematical business, okay? Much more mathematical. At the end of the day, we were relying less on opinion, less on brand names, uh, in terms of sort of the, the background of a person, more on data, and more on return on investment. And so for example, uh, we, we tracked sales per hour by employee versus, for that shift versus every employee in the country. And to see whether that employee was outperforming the regional average, the national average. Um, we looked at service plans per hour. We sell a lot of service plans. It's a big profit center for us. How many service plans are people selling? Why do you think it's important that we track service plan sales of a salesperson? More cash flow from selling service plans? Okay, sure. Other reasons? If you have two employees, one is selling uh, $100 an hour with no service plans, and one is selling $100 an hour plus some service plans, why is the second guy better? Go ahead. What's that? Customer lifetime value, great, okay. Uh -huh. Margins on service are much higher. Margins on service are much higher, for sure. Uh -huh. Okay, go ahead. More long-term, right? Creating a long-term relationship that, uh, with the customer. So if there was one way to track the effectiveness of a salesperson, it is the sales of service plans. Because a service plan is a different sort of conversation that you have with a customer. You're not just selling them the magic bullet which they saw the infomercial for anyway, and you got it, so they buy it. But it's that you're selling them a long-term relationship with that product. You're telling them that three years later, that product's still gonna work for you. And that is a different sales process. It involves a different connection with the customer than simply selling a product like you would, you would buy it at a Best Buy or somewhere else. And so uh, that became our gauge of how to manage our sales force. Okay? So, uh, something that was measurable, that was tangible, and became the, the, the kingmaker and the queenmaker in our organization were the best salespeople, were the ones with the highest service plans. So, here, so these are just examples of how the business became more mathematical, it became more strategic, more, uh, more, uh, more uh, uh, tactical and data driven. Number one product in 2007, remote control helicopters. There were remote control helicopters flying in every store all the time, it was just unbelievable. And when people saw it, and they could actually try it themselves, they just uh, fell in love with this concept. So then 2008 hit, and we were up to 40 stores. Uh, and September 15th, 2008 was an important day. Anyone know why? Lehman Brothers, Lehman Brothers great. Um, Lehman Brothers went under on September 15, 2008. And you haven't, uh, you haven't missed a slide. We're not in the corporate finance world. Why does this matter to us? Drain on liquidity of cost markets, okay, so. Rising costs of borrowing. Rising costs of borrowing, okay. The overall recession, so people are being more restricted in exposure to income, so they're less being restricted, so they're less likely to be hit first, whatever that is. Sure, we might be hit first because we're, we're selling wants, not needs, and less disposable income would go around. Okay. 
Does anyone think that our business would uh, do better after Lehman Brothers went under? Okay, you? Yes? You're from Canada, so that does, you know. All right, we just talked about it. Um, so, uh, number, one, uh, number one product that year uh, was the H2O mop, okay, the steam mop. So while Wall Street was being cleaned up, we were cleaning up the homes of Canadians, okay? Um, here's why uh, Lehman Brothers going under was really important to us. Uh, our business, by and large, especially the as seen on TV portion of it, is driven by television advertising. The amount of television advertising that takes place is driven by advertising rates. Advertising rates are driven by general consumer sentiment. And so big Fortune 500 companies stopped advertising. They stopped doing brand ads, uh, especially the banks at that time. Uh, but they stopped um, advertising their commercials on television. And so television networks had a problem. They didn't have enough content to fill the air, airwaves. And so they dropped their rates, and yet there still wasn't enough to fill the airwaves. So if you have to fill the airwaves with content that can air on any channel, at any time, often simultaneously, where you see five different channels with the same show, and even back to back where you see the same show repeated over and over and over on the channel, what would that be? It would be a 30 minute television infomercial. And so the boom times began. <laughs> so in 2009, we just had a banner year. Okay, 50 stores uh, we had gotten to by this point and um, infomercials were everywhere. They were flooding every, uh, every uh, network, every airwave, the products that we sold, the core of our business, which was, which was not all the business, but about half of our business, um, uh, just started to take off. People were not traveling as much. They were staying home, watching television, going to the mall. Okay? Perfect. We were, we were in the right place at the right time. Um, so infomercials were everywhere. Meanwhile, the non-TV diversification, so selling those non-as-seen-on-TV products, things like remote control helicopters and memory foam bedding and other things, that diversification was working as well. Uh, and at the same time, other retailers weren't doing well. So real estate started to become more and more available. So landlords were looking for retailers that were growing in, this, in these tough times. And so locations started to come up at reasonable rents. Number one product in 2009, the Snuggie. It's the blanket with sleeves. Um, I'm not kidding, just imagine like senior retail professionals gathered around a boardroom table arguing over whether leopard print Snuggies or zebra print Snuggies are the one to bet on for Christmas, right? So this, this was just a crazy phenomenon. Lineups out the stores, people fighting fist fights over Snuggies for some reason. Uh, n number one, number one uh, type of Snuggie that sold, number one um, um, print was leopard print. Leopard print number one, okay? Keep that in mind, that's important. Uh, okay, so, um, so 2009 was a great year, and then uh, it went from there. So by 2011, we had 82 stores. Uh, there are only 115 malls in Canada, okay? To give you an idea of market size, only 30 million people, 115 major malls. We were now in 82 of them. And 2011 was a huge turning point where the business was reinvented in a very, very special way, and it was through big data. How do you think we used big data? back in 2011? Detect, Detect customer trends. Absolutely. So the old way of buying was going to trade shows, flying to China, going, looking at factories, going to competitors like Brookstone and Sharp Rimage and seeing what they had, you know, looking for some social proof about what's, what, what other people are carrying. And that is notoriously unreliable as a predictor of success. It is very hard to know that something will sell. And if there's any retail buyer who says, you know, I just, you know, I've got that gut feel, I can pick them. It's not true. Even the best retail buyers are wrong probably half the time. So it's a very tricky business. And what changed is the advent of big data. And so I'll give you an example. When we looked at our sales of Snuggie, and then we layered on big data that we had gathered from various sources, various free sources, it might be online searches, it might be um, customer requests in store, customers walking in saying, do you have this product? No, you don't, okay, that sort of thing. Um, uh, uh, Twitter was relatively new at this time, but uh, looking at uh, uh, tweeting data, Facebook posts, and other things, we started to see an unbelievable correlation. 
Unbelievable correlation. The amount of buzz being created and the sales we had in store were almost perfectly correlated. And it kind of makes sense. The thing is, which data should you look at and how should you slice the data to get that insight? And that's really what we started to figure out in 2011. And so we created trend algorithms. It started as a part-time project for me. I would, I'm more a statistician than a retailer. I dove into the numbers and tried to find a pattern. Is there a way to know that something is trending before you hear about it at a cocktail party or before you read about it in a newspaper? And that is the big insight that we had. So while other retailers, even to this day, operate based on what vendors are pushing, we operate based on what customers are seeking. And it's a very different way of operation. Uh, it also makes us much, much more nimble and agile because we are moving with whatever the customer may want at that time, and that changes a lot. So we started to develop these trend algorithms, and it allowed us to time the entry, the exit, the cost, and the price of the trend that we were carrying. So think about SOM, investment management theory. That's what this was, applied in a retail context. Having uh, a mutual fund approach to retail trends and figuring out which ones have the highest chance of success, investing a small amount of inventory, proving out the model, proving out the ratio between this much buzz equals this much sales, and then amplifying that by growing the, 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 the sourcing of that product. And then knowing what are the leading indicators to tell us when to get out. When is it hitting a saturation point? At what point do people say, ah, not another Snuggie? Um, and being able to, uh, to uh, quantify and, and systematize that was the big insight of 2011. And it's, and it's only grown since, but that was the, the start of it. Uh, and so it went from carrying random unique products, like robotic massage chairs, for example, to trends, to the things that people are looking for right now. And it might not be the thing you expect. Number one product in 2011. Now this is recent stuff. Number one product. Hmm? Magic, Jack. Magic Jack, no, not number one, that was a big one. It was the no-no, um, uh, which is the, uh, the long-term hair growth reducer and remover. Um, so, so here we are in 2014, last year. Uh, we had 101 stores, and by this point, it had become a virtuous circle. There were a number of things that we were doing, and each thing that we were doing was growing something else in the business and sort of making the, the, the circle stronger. So we were gathering more and more trend data. Every product we carried was one more set of data that we could use to understand the correlation between external you know, trendingness, buzz, with internal sales. Uh, so more trend data gave us more access to products. We would now be able to phone a vendor who no other retailer had contacted and say, you know what, you're sitting on gold and we're gonna help you commercialize that gold. And getting rights and getting licenses before other people could. Okay. And that's why we're the exclusive retailer of Nono in Canada. And no one else has the product. It's because we got in at the right time. We negotiated the deal at the right time. Um, more rights, more licenses, more trends means more stores. Landlord said, wow, you guys are selling all the trendy products that no one else in the mall seems to have. Let's give you more locations. Obviously, that means more revenue, uh, which allowed us to attract more talent. So we built our team, and around and around and around the circle goes. And so we've come a long way from where we were in the dark days in 2003 uh, to build something that's much more sustainable, uh, sustainable in terms of uh, a, a business that can weather the storms of the ups and downs of products. We've been able to manage risk and understand in a very tricky and complicated and risky game, what to buy, what to sell, and how to get in, get out. Um, and we've, uh, we've built a, a more stable business in that way. Any questions on sort of that story and how we got to here? Go ahead. Um, I just a couple quick questions. First, how, at this point, how much are you still relying on the ad team on TV product? Right. Right. Okay, great question. So in terms of uh, the mix of As Seen on TV, it's about half of the business today. 
Uh, 10 years ago, it was 100% of the business. So we've built that non-TV business, which actually opens us up to a more mainstream customer, not just the people who may be looking for a specific infomercial product. On the e-commerce side, we were late to the game on e-commerce because of the type of product we sell. We're selling a product where some, uh, the customer wants more than just to buy it because they can already buy it from an infomercial or from wherever else. They want information, they want the sensory experience in store. And so e-commerce wasn't a strategy for us, but uh, it, is, it is now. So uh, we, do, we don't do much in e-commerce, it's still very small, but uh, it's growing very quickly. As customers get to know us, know our brand, and the store is becoming more of a showroom, you know, to use the, to use the term, uh, and we're capturing those sales online. Okay. Uh, another question, sorry, go ahead. The cost of developing the videos? Yeah, cost and the effort. So typically, uh, the, so the advertisement itself, the infomercial that may be on television, that's entirely the vendor's uh, responsibility. That's their business, that's their, that's their core business. Um, they realize that most people will not call the television. Most people will not buy from their website. Uh, only about 12% of the population does. And so we are there to help them say, let's, let's help you get that extra 88% or the missing 88% by giving you the retail exposure. So our investment is more on the retail side. It might be in displays, in training, in, uh, in demonstrations. They would handle the media and the advertising cost. Okay. Go ahead. Do you ever see a point, maybe it's getting to that point, where Showcase and similar uh, competitors can start to become the pacemakers for different product versus kind of chasing the trend on the front end, or is that even a viable model? That's a great question. Um, uh, so we're the trend spotters, but can we be the trend makers? Um, and we've, we've debated this internally. Uh, and I'll give you the analogy of Apple versus Google. Um, uh, and maybe it's a, a crude analogy because Apple and Google both do both uh, many different things, but I'll talk about their core business. Apple is a taste maker, right? They go when people say no one wants to buy tablets, and they say, well, we're going to make a tablet that people want. Okay? And there's a, there's, a, there's a prescience there. They're able to spot the future. Who knows whether they still can without jobs, but uh, they are tastemakers. On the other hand, Google is not a tastemaker. Google, Google actually catches the trends, for example, in its search algorithms. Whatever you want to search for, whatever you want to buy, use Google. So Google is trend agnostic. They don't care what you're searching for. They'll give you the most relevant result based on your need. So there's a deference to the customer in the case of Google. With Apple, there's a deference to the customer, but it's slightly different. It's more that we'll tell you, you know, we'll tell you what's, what's right, okay? Um, we see ourselves as a Google. We see ourselves as the Google of retail because our job is to make the system. We are completely trend agnostic. If the product is a, a blender or if it's a, a, a helicopter or a, a, a pillow, it doesn't matter to us. We want to give the customer what's hot, what's buzzed about, what's interesting, and be less uh, of a curator of what products we think they would really like. Go ahead. Uh, given all this discussion, so how, uh, what are the sources of the big data? And how do you get uh, the, the data for, the, for analyzing the, the trend? Right. So that's, that's our secret sauce. So uh, I have an NDA for you to fill out later, and then I can tell you all about that. <laughs> but um, uh, but uh, it, it, uh, it, there's a number of different sources. I'll give you a very simple low-tech example. Customer requests. I talked about this. Uh, I uh, touched on it briefly. Right now, when a customer walks into a retail store and says, do you carry this product? The retailer, if they don't carry it, they say, no, we don't. And that is the end of the transaction. In our case, that information, so you, you say, I saw something on TV. It's a blue roller. I'm not even sure what the name is. We say, no problem. We go over to SAP in the store, and we enter that information in. That information feeds automatically into an algorithm that is tracking what people are looking for. And we, we've, we've collected hundreds of thousands of, of these requests uh, over time. And that feeds into an algorithm that then helps us understand, is that a one-off? Is it just a blip and we can ignore it? Is it a regional trend? Is it a national trend? Is there something that we are catching on to that perhaps others haven't? And then th that drives our sourcing priorities, our, our strategy that week. You know? So there's an example of a data set that we've, we've developed internally that can help drive our, uh, our sourcing. Mm -hmm. uh, so look, I think hearing also, I mean, that's a multi-million dollar investment, and it seems that since you know, 2009, 2011, it's been big data 
Right. Be very so SAP is very new. Billions of dollars spent in one instance. Right. So SAP is very new. We installed it in 2012. So over time, we had this patchwork of various different systems that, it, that worked for the moment, but they weren't scalable. There were all kinds of problems. So SAP became that integrated solution. Very expensive, but we're ruthless about ROI. We paid for SAP in one year, meaning we got the profit to the bottom line to pay for the entire capital cost, including um, the consultants and the implementation and all of that. Most people, most companies would not look for a one-year payback, but we do. Uh, and so, you know, we did get to that and we're really, we're really happy with it. Go ahead. You talk about your decision to stay in Canada versus expanding into the U.S. Right. Great, uh, great question. So we're going to talk about Brookstone next. Uh, but um, our focus was really, fo you know, keep doing what we're doing as long as there's a mall that we can open and just keep, keep opening in those malls in Canada. So that's what we've been focused on. Go ahead, sir. I, I was looking at the uh, year-in-year yield and everything. Uh-huh. Right, we have no stores in that one province. So Quebec is a very different animal. It's a, it's a French-speaking province, but it's more than just language. There's a, there's a cultural divide, and uh, f foreign retailers, which may be retailers from Toronto, uh, may be seen as, um, as you know, outsiders and not accepted by the Francophone community. So uh, there's also a very um, tricky language laws where you have to communicate with your staff in French. You're not allowed to communicate with them in English, which creates all kinds of complications. You know, everything from my computer is not working, you know, calling our IT help desk, we'd have to have a French language support there, even though both parties can speak English. So you're considering about your cost as well. Right. So we, we felt we'd have to replicate the entire infrastructure, and we think we could only open 15 to 20 stores in Quebec, so it's not worth it for, for that. Okay. Go ahead, Colin. Yeah. No. Uh, when I say 115 malls, that excludes Quebec. Uh, and uh, so the ones that are left are, it's just a matter of waiting for space and having the right, uh, right location and the right deal. Some malls are prestige malls. You, you go into those malls to be known that you're in that mall, but it isn't a profitable mall. And so to, to what we learned in the past about, not, you know, about focusing on ROI, we don't go into those malls. We're not interested in the prestige as much um, if it's not going to make money on its own. You know, today, every one of our stores is profitable. Every one of our stores is profitable. And with Brookstone, half of the stores are profitable. Like, there's a dramatic difference in the unit level economics. Uh, and it's because we stay out of certain types of malls. Okay. Go ahead. Um, when you're selecting the, pro uh, the products for your store, do you just care about the trends? Or do you have any metrics to measure, like, the products themselves and, like, their efficacy? You know, like, the, the app belt tank is going to do well. I just looked up the no-no on Amazon, and it's not pretty, you know. I imagine that has some potential long-term results. Do you measure those at all in your products, or are you just trying to deliver what people are what trying to buy? So we uh, quality control test every one of our products before we carry it. But what we say about the products is that um, it's not a binary process of whether the product passes QC or doesn't pass QC. It's, in fact, the first step in understanding what the product can and can't do. And it's simply a starting point. So when Nono has bad reviews on Amazon, that is the best thing for our business. We love it. We, we call it the C-shaped curve, okay? So when you look at the ratings, uh, you know, some people give it a five, most people give it a one, and so it's a C-shape, okay? Uh, we love those. And what that means is that people were not adequately trained or aware of how to use the product, how to get the best use out of it, and they didn't know the things that the infomercial won't tell you. And so we have a place now. We have a job to do, which is how do we educate the customer on what the product can and can't do, what parts of the infomercial may be overstating the truth, and you know, how can we set realistic expectations? So, uh, so when quality um, is, a, is a question or an issue, it actually is great for our business, because that means we have value to add. Go ahead. So with the advent of e-commerce and less foot traffic in malls, uh -huh. Any of that playing out into like the long term strategy, or are you even seeing an impact by that? Because it seems like you guys have been relatively insulated from what would seem to be things that would, you know, impact the business, but you, you seem to be able to get around that. Is this another area where business just continues to thrive, even though you have all these different avenues and macro trends that would suggest that it should? 
Okay, so let's talk about the e-commerce trend. It's certainly something we need to be aware of and, and adapt to. But e-commerce has affected certain categories of retail much more than others. For example, books and DVDs, the retailer offers very little value in, the, in that transaction, and so that easily can be bought online. But in our type of products, it very specifically is a different sort of product. It's a type of product that you can't, um, you're not really going to get the full education or experience by simply buying online, and you may just be disappointed because you didn't really understand what you were buying. Uh, and so our category is insulated in a way. Uh, I think another way to look at it is uh, takeout uh, or delivery, uh, pizza delivery versus uh, a restaurant. They both exist and they can both coexist. If you simply want a cheap pizza, you just order it and it'll arrive in 30 minutes. But if you want an experience and you want to go out and it's a social thing, you want to spend time being entertained, being educated, find out what the specials are today. Maybe I don't know what I want to buy. Um, we're the restaurant. In that, in that example. So I think there's a home for, for various channels and bricks and mortar is by no means dead. Uh, in fact, bricks and mortar is, is having a revenge of sorts as the experience in store becomes more uh, interactive and more, um, uh, more engaging uh, than ever. Go ahead, sir. Right, okay. So on the first question of how much more profitable is it uh, at, uh, since big data, our sales per store are up about 30% since the advent of big data, okay? So I don't know any retailer that can say that their same store sales are up 30% in the last four years, but that's what's happened to us. Uh, it's because we've gotten better at picking the product, knowing when to get in and when to get out. That's a big part, uh, which speaks to your second question, which is what is the risk? Uh, and so uh, the biggest risk is inventory. We buy inventory, we pay for it up front, and we've got to sell it. Uh, and so if you buy wrong, you can get, you can get hung very quickly. Uh, and so we have ways to mitigate that risk. We typically will buy smaller amounts to start, prove the theory, uh, and then expand the selection, things like that. Um, I'm going, I know there's only a few minutes left, right? So we have, uh, we have until, I think, till one. Okay. So if you run a little late, and we'll say, because I know you were no problem. I'm going to move to Brookstone and then we'll, we'll, we'll come back in a second. Uh, number one product in 2014, Disney Frozen, all right? Uh, <laughs> huge. Um, I'm going to skip past this part here, um, but this is sort of an example of what we can do with a product, uh, really give it some TLC. Um, so let's go back to our friends at Brookstone. So Brookstone in 2007 had 330 stores. They were uh, taken private. They were bought by uh, Osim, which is a Singapore massage chair manufacturer and retailer for $445 million, um, and that was a great price. Brookstone was doing very well. They were the people we emulated. And in 2014, uh, they had 240 stores. They went under uh, early last year, and we thought the purchase price would be around $120 million, um, which we thought was the best way to break into the US market um, with a, a good brand name and a sort of a footprint, uh, but where we could add some value. Uh, and so this became my mission. Last year I spent uh, the majority of the year on this bid to buy Brookstone. It, it, and it was great for my ego as well. It was a feeling that I, we had looked at Brookstone all those years and now we're gonna get, we're gonna get him. Uh, and so this became a, uh, a, big, a big project for us. Uh, and we really saw it as, as catching the big fish, okay, catching the whale here. Uh, and it's because Brookstone had a strong name. Uh, it had the US market, which is where the big money is. You know, there's 10 times the, uh, you know, the population and opportunity in the US. And it had a very strong e-commerce presence. About a quarter of its business is e-commerce. E so there was a, a, a lot we could learn from Brookstone. On the other hand, they needed trend intelligence. They were carrying products that didn't sell. Well, that's a fundamental in the trend business. Don't carry products that aren't selling. And so they had a problem of uh, product uh, selection. And our big data algorithms could have helped. Uh, but also they had a problem of entrepreneurship. It is an entrepreneurial business. You need to be able to do deals and uh, adapt and be nimble, and they had lost some of that, uh, and it could be streamlined. They were, they were, we believe that they were too uh, large for the sales uh, that they generate. Um, uh, unfortunately, that was not meant to be. Anyone know what city this is? Shanghai, Shanghai very good. Uh, it was not meant to be because we were outbid by Sandpower, um, uh, a large conglomerate uh, in China in the retail space and in others for 173 million. Remember we thought we could do the deal for 120? We were, we were in the running, we thought it was a done deal. 
And uh, the final uh, price was 173 million, which was way more than the core asset value of the business. Here was a bankrupt retailer uh, seen as a declining brand, uh, not the place to go anymore for, for that sort of product, and $173 million was paid. Why is that? Why was so much paid by Sandpower? Because their goal is to open 1,000 Brookstone stores in China. And so the 240 stores in the US, half of which were not profitable, was really a rounding error in a part of a grander plan. Now, of course, they want to fix Brookstone, they want to, they want to improve it, but the real money for them is China, uh, where the real money for us was the US. Uh, so um, uh, so they were, their ability to pay, their patience, uh, which is a, a, something I've learned about the Chinese, a very patient, long-term capital. The ROI that I care so much about is not as critical for them in the short term, because they have a long-term view about what they can do with the business. Uh, and so their plan was to open 1,000 stores in China. Uh, and so uh, we lost, and it was unfortunate, but uh, we almost did it. Um, so the question is, what's next? Uh, we're a national profitable retailer. The malls are saturated in English Canada. Um, we we're trying to figure out whether we should have a new format, you know, have a format outside of malls, uh, standalone stores, perhaps store within a store inside other retailers. Do we go to the US? Do we go organically or perhaps uh, uh, through some sort of acquisition? And so finally, I'll end with some thoughts, not advice. Beware of theories. Uh, learn which one to use when, because there's lots of theories. There's one for every uh, situation, but it's the, the wisdom is in which one. Failure was the best lesson. It gave me a lot of confidence. Um, the harder you work, the luckier you get. Um, it was a very uh, twisty road. It was not a straight path. And it wasn't the things that we necessarily banked on that worked, but something worked. Something clicked along the way, and it was just a function of uh, some luck and some work. Um, and always keep reinventing. Brookstone went from the heights uh, to uh, where they went to in just seven years. And we've done the same thing and come back. Uh, and so uh, there's always someone over your shoulder. Uh, and with that, I thank you. <laughs> All right. Sure, go ahead. So why did the Chinese people operate? Why did they want Brookstone? Does Brookstone already have a presence in China that they want to capitalize on? Or did they just want to have relationships with vendors? Like, I, I guess I, didn't, I understood your guys' point as well. So right. So the, the great thing about Brookstone, because they have a large airport presence, is that they're internationally known. It's an international brand. And so taking Brookstone to China would be easier than uh, doing it with a, a, a new brand. Uh, so that's, that's a big part of it. Also, all the products come from China, and they have relationships in the Chinese market that perhaps could have aided in better sourcing. Okay. Go ahead. Um, in terms of consumer marketing to consumers, uh, N no, I mean, that's a big untapped opportunity for us. I think a lot of retailers have used big data with customers, building loyalty programs, getting to know each customer, uh, and marketing to them, one-on-one -on -one marketing. Our focus has been on product selection, because we figure if we've got the right product, then the customer will buy anyway. But I think that's a crude approach. I think we need to have both. And so the focus is now on consumer marketing as well. Sure. So there's definitely a core, uh, a core customer that keeps coming back. But as our product selection has expanded and improved, and we have more mainstream trends than ever, for example, Frozen, everyone in Canada bought Frozen from us. I mean, it was it, because it's such a broad trend uh, that we're getting new customers all the time. So I think most customers, you've got three Elsa costumes, there you go. You know, you know, you know it. Uh, so yes, that's evolving. Go ahead. Uh, the single most important reason that the Brookstone valuation uh, was dropped o over those seven years? Yes. So the reason is that uh, the types of products they were selling became uh, less and less proprietary, less and less unique, less and less trending. Also, sourcing from China became easier and easier during that time. And so it was very easy for every retailer to go and bring in a memory foam pillow. It's, it's, uh, you can do that before breakfast. It's very simple. And so their advantage dropped over that time. Is it also a good time to follow up? Like with Brookstone, their price points were higher, so yes. their model was built around that, so that it becomes easier 
Absolutely. The recession didn't help them at all. Uh, they were catering uh, more to a Wall Street customer rather than a Main Street customer, if you put it that way. So, uh, and they had a curated approach. They said, you know, we, we know what our customer wants. And so they would, they would turn their nose up at a, at a trend that may not fit their criteria, when in fact the customer just wants to buy that other product. So just, you know, they're going to go elsewhere. Absolutely. Um, uh, no, I don't think it's a it's a it's a legitimate threat because Canada, to most retailers, is a incremental side market, uh, which with its own intricacies, French issue and other things. Um, also, uh, Target, which came to Canada and with such huge fanfare, just announced that they're pulling the plug on all 133 stores and 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 going back to the U.S. sort of retreating. So, no, I don't think the appetite is there for for them to come to Canada. Yeah, I think uh, I think it could, um, um, but I think that big big retailers are catching up. I think the the problem for them is not just having the data, and knowing what to buy. It's being able to move quickly. They've become very large bureaucracies, most mass retailers, and so to even get a product listed. Can